I have the honor of serving on the Nevada City Council, and I also have the honor of representing the 11 cities in Marin County on the Association of Bay Area uh, Governments Executive Board. Wanted to welcome you to the third public workshop and open house that we have convened on Plan Bay Area so far. Um, we've had one uh, three years ago, two years ago, and then today. We're trying to pick different towns for each of these. And I also wanted to thank you all very much for coming out early on a Saturday morning. I know there's a lot of competing events today, but um, your participation shows that you really care about your town and um, our county. Um, I have the honor of introducing our uh, supervisor, David Connolly. He was uh, sworn in as a District 1 supervisor in January of 2015, and he represents uh, Centerville and uh, the unincorporated neighborhoods. Um, he served on the uh, Centerville City Council for seven years, and during that period, he worked really hard to sustain the city's vibrant global economy, protecting the vital public services uh, during the economic downturn, and really working hard to balance the budget. He made City Hall more responsive to the needs of the neighborhoods and the residents of Center Hall, and helped expand transportation options for local residents, and also worked uh, through his passion on the Red Clean Energy of Board of Directors. Actually, since the inception um, in 2008, and he served as chair as the um, Red Clean Energy from 2011 to 2014. Before he was elected, he um, had his own law practice in Centerville. And before that, he was the supervising deputy California Attorney General prosecuting energy companies that, quote, gouged our um, state during the energy crisis of 2000 2001. So if you could please, oh, and he's also the Metropolitan Transportation Commission representative for Warren County. And if you could please join me in welcoming Dan O'Connell. Thank you, uh, Pat, for that kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Are we awake yet? Yeah. Somewhat, in my case, but I noticed there's uh, some coffee in the back. I really just wanted to welcome folks to what uh, we hope is a very productive uh, morning uh, going over the most recent update on Plan Bay Area. Uh, starting with a wholehearted thanks to the staff of uh, MTC and ABAG for putting this program together. If we could give them a quick round of applause. I want to thank Mill Valley for hosting. This is always such a great venue for any event, uh, including uh, this one. And of course, my colleague, uh, Council Member Pat Eklund, who was really instrumental, uh, not only in putting this event together, but also in an ongoing, uh, very strong representation for all of our local towns and cities on ADAC, if we can get Pat on it. So as we know, it's going to be crucial that uh, our uh, unique local perspectives and, and local voices be heard throughout this process. Um, uh, many of us have been involved for a number of years in uh, Plant Bay Area and, and making those uh, perspectives known. Uh, that's never going to be uh, more important than now. So I think part of what we're looking for uh, throughout this program this morning and beyond as we have a uh, formal public comment uh, period that is ongoing right now is uh, let us know what's on your minds um, in terms of any concerns uh, with the process or, or with what's being proposed and our jobs as your uh, representatives in my case on MTC in Pat's case and uh, my colleague Dennis Rodoni uh, supervisor, who is also our ABAG representative, is to uh, let us know what's on your mind. So with that, I believe I'm going to turn it back over to Pat uh, for some more specific details. So thanks again.
Thanks, David. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, there are some elected officials in the room that I'd like to uh, introduce, and if you could please hold your applause until the end. Uh, first one is Jim Andrews from Madera. If you could all please stand up, that'd be great. Jim Andrews from Madera. Renee Goddard from uh, the town of Fairfax. Uh, Pam Drew from the city of Nevada. Kevin Hara from the uh, town of Larkspur. Stephanie Moulton Peters, city of uh, Larkspur. Well, we're all towns, right? Uh, Mill Valley and uh, Stephanie Moulton Peters. Um, Eric Lucan, uh, city of Nevada. And uh, Dennis Rudini, a uh, supervisor of the 4th District, uh, which is uh, well, all over the bit. I'll get a better introduction later. So please give them a round of applause. Um, I, too, wanted to give a big shout out to all the staff. And there's two particular staff that I would like to at least come up in front. I'm sorry, Ursula. Ursula Volker and Ellen Griffin. Is Ellen, uh, is she outside? If someone could pull her back. I, I want these two ladies. There's actually a third, but she's not here today. Uh, so Ellen, if you could come on up in front, please. I'm sorry. These ladies asked me not to do this, but I have to tell you, without Catalina Alvarado, without Ursula Volker, without Ellen Griffin, this workshop would have never happened. So please give them a round of applause. Really, uh, they anticipated everything that I forgot, and uh, they organized everybody. There was a assignment sheet. We have a whole group of MTC and AVAC staff. Um, I want to introduce you now. I'm not going to introduce the ones that are going to be speakers. Um, and I want you all to remain standing so that we can give you a round of applause as well. Um, John Goodman, Terry Lee, and please stand up. If they're outside, Ellen, can we have them please come in? All MTC and ABAC staff, we're a team working together. There we go. So this is John Goodman. Uh, please remain standing and we'll do a, a round of applause afterwards. Where's Terry Lee? Terry, are you here? Adam Nolte. Adam, please stand up. There he is in the back. Uh, Kurt Singa, are you here? Dana Breckwald, I know Dana's here. Uh, Paisley Strellis and Lisbeth Sunshine. And um, we also, so let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, I do want to recognize two members of the Transportation Authority of Wren. Um, are we here? And if you could please stand up, hold your applause to both of them are introduced. Derek McGill is in the back, and then Molly Graham. Molly, there she's standing up. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> As you know, it takes a lot to put on a workshop like this, but it is really critical that the community in Marin keeps engaged and informed about Plan Bay Area. Um, Plan Bay Area schedule, as you know, is going to be adopted by both MTC and the ABAG boards in July of this year. And as SB 375 requires, there's a four-year update, or redo of this. Um, and so this plan that we're going to be adopting um, in July are going to feed into our regional housing needs allocation. Uh, because it actually has to be approved uh, by the board of directors of ABAC, the board, um, in 2021 um, in order to implement it with the arena distribution that starts for year 2022. For those who do not know, the regional housing needs allocation, we call it arena, actually allocates the housing and the jobs um, numbers to all the cities and the counties in the nine county gate area. So we have 101 cities and um, nine counties. So today is an opportunity for us to really learn about this um, update. And there's a lot of uh, new things, especially in plan of action, which is going to get its own separate discussion this uh, later this morning. Um, and um, I'm just really honored that um, we're able to have the 
um, folks here that um, are going to be part of the panel. I'd like to introduce um, Stephanie Bolton Peters, who is the moderator of our first panel. Stephanie is the uh, vice mayor of um, Mill Valley, the agenda was incorrect. Um, and she has served um, on the Mill Valley City Council. This is her third term. And she has served on the Smart Board. She serves as chair of the Transportation Authority of Marin. She has a passion for safe routes to schools and uh, making sure that our students are safe and yet the traffic still moves. And um, she's been a real leader in our county. She serves on the North Bay Division Board of Directors for the League of California Cities and um, has served as chair of the mayors and council members for uh, Ray County. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie Moulton Peters. So many of you here in Mill Valley. Pat, thank you for your introduction. And also, I want to thank Pat. This is our third workshop that Pat has planned in collaboration with all the agencies and local and regional. And it's really a very high quality panel and workshop that you will experience today. And I really want to thank you, Pat, for your leadership on this. So and also Dan and Connolly for your leadership at MTC. It's a great team that we have. So I have the pleasure of introducing our first panel, which will give a background to the Plan Bay area that Pat just talked about. We'll be going over vital signs, and you'll hear what that is. We'll talk about Marin since 2010, and then we'll have an overview, a deeper dive into the Plan Bay area. So our first speaker, will be Dave Bogsman of MTC, talking about vital signs. And he is the senior planner and analyst at MTC, leading the agency's efforts in the field of performance assessment and performance monitoring over the past seven years. David serves as the project manager for Vital Signs Initiative, tracking regional trends, manages performance analysis for projects and long-range plans, including Plan B area and leads MTC's implementation efforts for federally required target setting. And you're gonna learn what all that means in just a minute. He received a Master of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and has a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Cornell. So with that, I'd like to welcome David to, this, to the podium. Direction and where we're moving in the wrong direction. 
Uh, second, you can explore interactive maps for all of these different uh, topic areas. And the screenshot here actually shows the detailed data on walk commute times for every uh, census tract here in Marin County. What else can you do? You can explore sea level rise data, identify the households that will be at risk at different levels of forecasts for uh, sea level rise as a result of climate change, as well as uh, the number of people who live in each of those zones. And the map on the right shows uh, some of the tools that we have with regards to, with regards to metro comparison. So you can actually understand how the Bay Area stacks up compared to the nine other most populated metros in the United States. So here you actually see a graphic showing the flows of new residents coming to the region and where people are moving to. But enough about, about the website tool. There's lots there. I want to focus on just a subset of the indicators on the site and really delve into what's happening in Marin County. So first, let's start with, with my uh, first finding. Growth in the region has uh, slowed in, in almost all counties over time. Uh, but Marin County is unique in, the, in that it's accelerated at a much more rapid rate than other counties in the Bay Area. And this graphic here shows that trend. Uh, the red line is the regional annual population growth, whereas the orange line represents Marin County. As you can see, Marin has consistently trailed the region in terms of growth since the early 1970s uh, and stands stand as of 2016 at a 0.2% growth rate. Uh, again, that varies on an annual basis. Now, job growth has, has been a bit more, um, uh, has really had uh, ups and downs over time. And that's not just here, that's across the region. You'll see that uh, Marin County was hit hard by the Great Recession. That's the spike in 2010, uh, where there was a very precipitous decline in employment in the region and in the county. And today, job growth is slower than the rest of the regions. Uh, as of 2015, it was occurring at just under 2% job growth per year. There's a lot going on in this slide, but basically what we're showing here is looking back to the 1960s, all nine counties and uh, their growth trajectories. And what you'll see is that uh, Marin isn't entirely unique in this uh, slow growth trend. Other North Bay counties have followed a similar path albeit on a later time frame. Solano and Sonoma counties slowed during the 1980s and 1990s, so a bit later than Marin. But what you'll also notice here is those blue bars on the end, which represent the, tr the growth since 2010, that actually counties like Alameda County, Santa Clara County, and San Francisco are seeing a quite, quite a significant <coughs> increase in population over this time period. Moving on to permitting, again, the, the trend is, is similar, a decline on the regional and county levels for new housing units. And this speaks a bit towards the affordability challenges the region has with the lack of housing supply. Uh, Marin's graph on the right side uh, increases the vertical scale by a factor of 10, but even then, it's probably quite difficult to see uh, the exact statistics because the permitting levels are relatively low. Uh, in terms of housing, Plan Area 2040 anticipates just under 300 units per year in Marin. In 2015, Marin produced roughly 139 units in that year, but on an annualized basis between 2000 and 2015, it was roughly 331 units per year. So that growth rate into the future is very similar to what we've seen over the last 15 years in Marin. In the last five years, housing trends have changed quite a lot across the region. This is focused on the growth since 2010 in each of the counties in the Bay Area. And if you look at some of the other counties, notably San Francisco, Santa Clara counties, there have been significant spikes, albeit not, not enough housing to accommodate the growing number of residents and jobs in those locations. Moving on to the second finding from our work, uh, the current economic boom has had both benefits and drawbacks. Um, obviously, a significant benefit is the declining unemployment rate across the region. But on the other hand, we see a widening gap between the wealthy and the poor. Um, just starting with the economic boom, this graphic here reflects the gross regional product, which is, the, which is a measure, a very standard economic measure of output in the Bay Area. And you can see that over time, even on an inflation-adjusted basis, the region has grown quite significantly, powered by the San Francisco and San Jose metropolitan areas, which really are the primary growth areas in the region. The North Bay can, can, continues to constitute a significant but small share of the region's overall economy. 
Now, again, this, this growth has been most obvious in Silicon Valley with the, the booming tech firms. You can see that the economic output per person in those counties, in the counties in the South Bay, is now roughly $120,000 in value per person, so quite significant. This has created a widening gap between the North and the South Bay. Now, Marin County has been very fortunate, both in this current cycle and in previous cycles, with lower than average unemployment rates compared to the other Bay Area counties. But the good news is across the Bay Area, unemployment rates are now below 4%, which really is reaching that realm of natural unemployment, which is where um, people who are looking for jobs generally can, uh, can find work and employers uh, uh, are, are looking to hire. Moving on to incomes and wages. Marin County residents do have some of the highest household incomes of, of across, across the Bay Area. This graphic here shows how Marin uh, incomes are roughly similar to prosperous counties like Santa Clara and San Mateo to the south with their uh, high paying uh, uh, knowledge and tech sector jobs. Notable on this slide is San Francisco's trajectory shown in light blue. San Francisco is once the poorest county in the Bay Area. Today, it's rapidly approaching the income levels of Marin County. And again, that speaks to the widening wealth gap in the region. Now what's notable is those three counties, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara counties, all have the highest wages as well. But Marin County's wages are significantly lower, and this has caused a mismatch between jobs and housing where Marin residents have to commute out of the county for those high paying jobs. While Marin is more prosperous than its peer counties in many ways, it's also experiencing a lot of the same adverse impacts from issues like displacement and migration. Marin's poverty rate stands at 19% uh, when you look at 200% poverty rate levels to account for the cost of income, the lowest of all nine counties. And home prices have risen, albeit not to the same extent, as San Francisco and San Mateo counties, uh, again, which are a lot closer to the moving job centers. Rents also remain some of the highest in the Bay Area. Again, they are surpassed by San Mateo and Santa Clara County. All, and San Francisco County's rents remain uh, lower thanks to uh, rent control policies that have slowed the rise in rent payments in San Francisco. Uh, when we look at affordability in terms of housing as a percent of income, you can see that Marin County actually is very similar to the rest of the region because of its high incomes and high home prices, 33% of households are considered overly burdened as compared to 31% in the region. So relatively similar performance in that regard. Uh, due to the high income levels. Moving to the issue of displacement, uh, although this may seem like it's an urban problem most prevalent in places like San Francisco and Oakland, it certainly is not. But when we look at the nine counties, Marin County actually has the highest risk of displacement for lower income families of, of all of them. And although San Francisco used to be in that position, uh, Marin now exceeds the displacement risk of San Francisco for those folks. That's certainly an issue that we should all be concerned about. We can see the migration flows, people moving in and out of the North Bay. And what you'll see here is we grow from the region up into three zones. The peninsula, San Francisco and Santa, uh, Silicon Valley are seeing a net out migration of 14,000 people per year to the East Bay and nearly 4,000 people a year to the North Bay especially Marin and Sonoma counties. Meanwhile, East Bay and North Bay residents continue to move east, east of the valley and east of Sacramento. Because of this lack of alignment between where jobs and housing are being created, we are seeing a rise in traffic congestion and commute times. Looking at the, the commute patterns for Marin County and workers and residents, roughly a third of workers and roughly a third of residents have to leave the county every day. This performance is significantly worse than other North Bay counties, for example, San, uh, Sonoma County, where four and five residents, more than four and five residents, can live and work in that county. When we look at where people are going to and coming from, Marin County is importing workers from lower cost Sonoma County, as well as some from San Francisco. And it's exporting workers to San Francisco to do the high paying jobs to the south. Commute times in Marin are actually quite similar to the rest of the region. 30 minutes for the average commute in the Bay Area, 31 here in Marin. But they've risen in recent years. Traffic congestion is actually at a uh, lower level here in Marin than the rest, the rest of the Bay Area. 6% of miles traveled in, in the Bay Area as a whole are in significant traffic congestion, less than 35 miles per hour. 
whereas 4% four, uh, four mile, four of miles traveled in Marin County, on Marin County highways uh, hit, this, uh, hit this threshold. Of course, this is a significant growth from levels during the Great Recession. You can see in 2008, uh, there, there were nearly, uh, really, effectively no miles traveled that, that hit that threshold. Uh, across the region, we made major strides in the last few years, uh, really in the last 15 years, in terms of reducing uh, the share of folks who commute by car. 5% of the region between 2000 and 2015 shifted out of their cars to uh, start taking transit, walking, or biking. Meanwhile, in Marin County, that statistic has only gone down by roughly one percentage point. And in part, this is due to the fact that in the rest of the region, where transit ridership is booming, that's not exactly the case here in Marin County. Bus ridership on Golden Gate buses and Marin Transit has declined over time, whereas ferry ridership on the ferry system has increased. Finally, one, my final finding uh, from this work is despite all these challenges, and there certainly are many, Marin has had some major success stories, and they've mainly been in the environmental front, in terms of protecting agricultural lands and open space. This graphic here shows the two-year uh, breakdown for acres of greenfield development, effectively building on farmlands or other, uh, other open space. Marin County is shown in orange, and you can see that Marin accounts for a very small share of, of this, and in fact in 2014, Marin actually added back natural lands as it, as it took lands from a former uh, air base and converted those back to natural purposes. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up here. Um, this slide just shows that breakdown again by county, and basically what you can see here is other than San Francisco, which has no farmlands to consume, Marin forms the best in this regard. And, and finally, with, with regards to San Francisco Bay, which is right, right outside there, uh, Marin has been a major player in terms of restoring the bay. The bay has actually grown by roughly 19,000 acres since we started protecting it in the late 1960s. And major wetlands restorations in places like Nevada and other parts of the North Bay have played a key role in expanding the size of San Francisco Bay over this year. <laughs> so with that, I think we're going to save questions for the end of the panel discussion. Um, but I would encourage you all to go check out the Vital Signs website. There's a ton more data there. As I said, 40 different top areas, and you can all customize it to your specific city or town, which I didn't have time to get into today. We'll have new data coming out in the next few few months on issues like transportation and the environment. Thanks so much. Thank you, David. I, I absolutely love this vital science tool. I encourage you to go online and check it out. I know I'm going to review the slides tonight. But they are really helpful in trying to get your head around what is going on in a more accessible and visual way. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is Bobby Liu, and Bobby will talk more about Marin since 2010. Bobby develops economic and demographic, excuse me, demographic forecast models, which tell stories about the region with data. His current work emphasizes understanding labor market and supporting local and regional economic development efforts. He joined ABAG as a regional planner in the fall of 2014 after a summer internship. Bobby received his master's degree in city and regional planning from the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. So welcome, Bobby. some depth on some of the issues it's really touched on. 
Particularly, I'll focus on the rain since 2010 and talks, talking a little bit more about the changes in population and households and the economy and the workers and the need to address resilience challenges. So from 2010 to 2015, the total population increased by about 6,000 and the household in Moraine increased by half a percent uh, and the higher increase in population, lower increase in household, the trend is similar to what's happening in the region. And this chart shows you the, per the percentage change in total population by age group in Moraine and Bay Area from 2010 to 2015. And Moraine is the blue and uh, the orange is the Bay Area. And we can see the retirement age group 65 to 84 years old increased by over 15% in these five years. Um, and the, in fact, Moraine, as I just said, total population increased by 6,000, and this age group alone increased by 6,300. So the population is aging. At the same time, we see the age group 18 to 24 years old, they increased by about 10% about as well. Uh, they are the young adults entering working age. But we see at the same time, well, Moraine is actually worth losing our working population from 25 years old to 54 years old. Uh, because they are the age groups, they are the population who are most likely to have kids. So we see also the under five years old, under five years old kids are shrinking as well. So for the next few slides, I'll talk about more about our seniors, young adults, and the working population. So in Moray, most of the seniors living in housing units. But as we, we can see here, uh, most of, although most of the uh, seniors living in family units, Moraine has higher share of seniors living in their home by themselves compared to the Bay Area uh, in, for both age groups. And particularly, 47%, that's about one out of every two seniors of 85 years and over are living at home by themselves. So as we were now living alone at an older age presents some particular challenges um, for this, for the seniors. And at the same time, in just the last five years, we see a significant more growth in senior owners with mortgages compared to the senior owners without mortgages. And also we see uh, senior renters increased by about 10,000, senior renter households increased by about 1,000 as well, a thousand as well. So at in the Bay Area volatile rental market, as rent prices goes up, and we know where rent prices is going up, um, that these renters, senior renters, will likely to face cost burdens, housing cost burden. And uh, at older ages, uh, senior owners with mortgage are as likely as these renters to face uh, housing cost burden. And in fact, in Moraine, burden remains high for senior households. So, 80, no, 49% of senior households with mortgage and 64% of senior rental households are paying at least 30% of their household income in housing. So, and at the same time, there's 70% of owners, senior owner households with, without mortgage are paying at least 3% of their household income on um, housing as well. So what's important to note is that as the seniors age and healthcare become an issue for, for the population and sometimes one probably major medical operation would leave the seniors in financially vulnerable situations and particularly for those already burdened by their housing costs. Um, and then next I want to talk about our young seniors and where do they live now. And apparently, according to census data, they're living with their parents. Well, Moraine, high share of adult children living at home with their parents compared to the Bay Area. 
So, and I want to point you to this 25 to 34 years old age group. As I just mentioned, this age group has actually lost population in Moraine in the last five years, from 2010 to 15. And for the remaining part, now one out of almost, almost one out of four young working age adults living with their parents at home now. Um, so that's a ten percent increase from what they were in 2010. So young adults, adult children, they don't come home because they don't have a job. Uh, and actually, one out of every two um, college age young adults and three out of every four um, working age young adults, they're actually employed. So what's the reason? for them actually to move back, move in with their parents while working. Um, so there are multiple reasons. They would probably, they love you so much and they move in. Uh, they would do so to save money. Uh, they would do so to take care of their elderly parents. Or they, can, they simply can't afford a place uh, in this community. And the thing to think about is, when they move to the next stage of their life, when college age young adults become working age young adults and working age young adults having their family, does this community have space for them to actually stay in? Or, uh, or are we going to repeat the trend of we're losing our working population uh, in the next five years um, or in the future? Is that the community want? And uh, I don't know the answer, but I would love to hear feedback on this. Um, so we talked about the working age population and I, I would, I'm talking a little bit more about the workers and the economy. Um, so private non-farm job, total private non-farm job, um, Moraine grew by 14% from 2010 to 2015, um, about 12 something. Uh, and Matt will tell you that uh, the allocation for Moraine from 2010 to 2040 is 13 something. So, in the five year period of time, we've already accomplished most of the job growth. And uh, in Moraine, the largest sectors in 2015 are educational and health service, professional and business service, leisure and hospitality, that includes um, art, entertainment, and restaurants, etc., and retail trade. And you can see the um, very strong service-based economy. Um, and in fact, these four large sectors uh, account for about 72% 70, of the total economy in Moraine. Um, they've talked about 64% uh, of, of, of the Moraine workers living there, um, living in Moraine, and the rest are imported uh, from the rest of the region or even outside of the region. So uh, we're talking about in commuter first, and then I'll go back to the Moraine in county workers. So Moraine has high share, this chart shows the share of jobs held by commuters outside Moraine by industry sectors. And Moraine has high share of lower wage jobs supported by in commuters. For example, transportation, warehousing, and utility sector, we see over 50% of this job, of the jobs in this sector are supported by in commuters. <coughs> not people living in Moraine. And half, a half of those in commuters um, are from people driving from San, uh, Richmond and San Rafael Bridge from Country Costa or down 101 from Sonoma. Um, I also marked um, the four largest sectors uh, here with the red line and they also have 30 to 40 percent of their um, jobs. Uh, in these sectors held by commuters outside of Moraine. Uh, so this slide looks at the 64% Moraine in county uh, workers. And I showed, particularly here, the share of jobs held by Moraine in county workers of 24, oh, should be 25, sorry, 25 to 54 years of age group. At least here, you can they are the working age population Moraine has lost population in the past five years. 
So when we look ahead, if we so when we look ahead, if Marine continue this trend of losing its working population, those jobs that are held by this age group people, age group population, will be likely to so they either go away because they can't find workers, or they either need to be filled by more in commuters that would add more transportation pressures to the local transportation system that moving in all directions. So, so that's one of the challenges in economic development is how do we address these transportation and housing issues systematically, right? So, Marine is the leader of preserving open space and agricultural land, but the same as other, part of, other parts of the region, um, this, it still faces some challenges in terms of resilience. Um, we all remember the recent drought, and also recently we have more and more extreme weather that are causing flooding and landslides uh, in the community. Um, and addressing the need to address uh, resilience challenges is very important for the quality of life in Moraine. And Plan B area offers a regional framework to address these issues and help preserving our uh, um, open space and our agricultural land. So I think Matt will talk more about what's in the plan, and um, you would you would also hear a lot about other regional efforts uh, throughout the event. So before I close, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. So you see, I'm a cyclist, uh, so I ride in Moraine a lot, like really a lot. Uh, so I took this photo with my friend while we climbed up from Alpine Dam to Montana. So every time I ride in Moraine, I would think about the legacies of people protecting the beautiful Bay Area and the open space, and I feel really grateful. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker on this panel is Matt Maloney, and Matt has joined us in our PAC workshops. He's going to give us now the deeper dive into Plan Bay Area, the goals and targets, the transportation investment strategy, and land use. Let me tell you a little bit about Matt. He's the principal for major projects at MTC, responsible for overseeing Plan Bay Area, and the sustainable community strategy in the RTP, Regional Transportation Plan, sorry. He also manages the agency's transit planning work and regional goods movement plan. Prior to MTC, Matt spent seven years at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, where he served as Deputy Chief of Staff and managed the agency's policy development goals and analysis activities. Matt has a Master's in Public Policy from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor's in Urban Studies from Brown University. And he is a resident of Graham County and lives in San Rafael with his family. Welcome, Matt, and let me turn the microphone over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Bobby had some slides there. One of them, I was looking at my own age cohort in terms of people that are moving to Marin County, um, or not moving to Marin County. And uh, actually, I moved to Marin County a couple years ago. Um, so folks of my age group with children are actually moving here as well. Um, and uh, so we also have concerns about, um, about our future, um, kind of protecting uh, the legacy of our open space. So I'm going to pull up the presentation, just bear with me. Set transportation priorities um, on a regional basis. 
Uh, what was new in 2013 and what remains new today is the SCS concept where we're thinking about land use, housing, our open space, and economy in tandem with transportation investments. Moreover, we have requirements um, that come down from the state that we need to set a blueprint for accommodating the region's population uh, and also reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions on a per capita basis. Um, you know, I was talking to Stephanie before uh, coming up here before the meeting, and I think, you know, one thing that I think is always important to bear in mind is a couple things. First, that these plans are blueprints. Um, but, but secondly, that these plans are not only about us. Uh, they really are also about the future generations of people uh, that are moving to Marin uh, and to the Bay Area. And I think those of us with young children at home, I think about that a lot. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of young children here today, but they are here. Um, and sometimes we have to keep in mind the time frame of these plans that we're talking about here is like 2040 or 2050. Um, and, and that's really a lot of times who we're talking about is those young people. Two agencies are involved in this effort. Uh, and they're all represented here, MTC and ABAG, we collaborate. Uh, MTC is a metropolitan planning organization in this region. Uh, we're largely a creature of the federal government. Um, ABAG is the Council of Governments. Um, and, and of course, some of you know that we're working through this process of potentially trying to merge some staffs together uh, into one. And that's an ongoing uh, effort. So it is a blueprint. We'll be doing these plans to coordinate land use and transportation policies, projects, and public investments. We do think that regional comprehensive planning has a lot of benefits. Um, you know, for one, uh, it reflects the reality that most of us live our lives on a regional scale. So for me, for instance, I live in Marin County. I work in San Francisco. Um, I have very close family down in San Mateo. Uh, county, uh, so we're always traveling around to different areas of the region. So that's really kind of how we how we live and breathe. Um, I think it's also important to say that when it comes to implementation of projects and programs on the ground, the details really matter, and there is no one size fits all. So of course, what might work in a place like San Francisco or Oakland or Silicon Valley is not necessarily a solution for Marin uh, County. We do uh, update these plans every four years, uh, so we're really constantly working on them and evolving uh, our methods. Uh, and again, as I said, this is an ongoing conversation about the kind of Bay Area we want to leave for our future generations. So this is a limited and uh, focused update for those of us in the trenches putting these plans together. It often feels uh, anything but limited and focused. We've been quite uh, busy. But uh, similar to last time, 2040 remains the horizon year of the plan. The single biggest effort that we really undertook in developing Plan Bay Area 2040 was updating the financial projections for transportation, doing a new call for projects, and really re refreshing that part of the plan. I think it's important to say the plan itself is a roadmap. It is not a funding vehicle. We do not directly allocate money to anything in this plan. Uh, it does not change local land use policies. And this plan is also, this plan is not connected directly to Reno. Uh, so those regional housing needs allocations numbers are not at stake in this cycle. Um, as we talked about, the next round for Reno is going to be 2021. Um, and at that point, we'll have the benefit of having another plan with the even further out time runs. We've done three rounds of outreach on this plan. Back last June, we recorded Madera talking to some folks about the scenarios. Uh, in November, MTC and ABAG approved the forecasted development pattern and transportation investment strategy, which forms the foundation of the plan document. Our economy is booming. I'm not going to go through all the stuff that Dave and, and uh, Bobby talked about. It's a historically extreme boom. It's increased prosperity for many Bay Area residents. At the same time, affordability challenges have gotten much worse in this region. Uh, and that has been exacerbated by a lack of housing production. I think that's just the reality. In this region, one house was built for every eight jobs created between 2011 and 2015. In terms of the process for developing our forecast development pattern, uh, what we do is we start with general plans uh, and zone it. But then we have some problems to work out. The first is, is really how we accommodate expected population growth and how we do it affordably, uh, and also how we corral greenhouse gas reductions. So we do run assumptions on some overlay land use policy strategies, and these are illustrative. Uh, they're not prescriptive, and they're used to influence the location and type of development that we forecast in the final preferred scenario. 
in large part, what these strategies do is they work to motivate development potential in priority development areas, which are locally nominated. We have a couple up here in Brayton County, but relatively few uh, compared to other parts of the region. Um, so these are not blanket policies uh, that the plan uh, assumes across the whole region. There are ways to motivate growth in some parts of the region, especially in those priority development areas. So we talked a lot about the regional forecast last June, uh, which is really a metropolitan-wide expectation uh, for household job growth. The expectation between 2010 and 2040 is 820,000 households and 1.3 million jobs. So these are figures that were approved uh, by ABAG, and, and these are numbers we also ran through uh, with some of you back in June. Of course, the collective problem we all face is that this region is projected to grow regardless of what we're doing in this plan. Um, so we're talking about 2.4, potentially a million people, potentially the need for 820,000 new housing units, which is kind of an inconvenient uh, truth. But it's the reality of what we see given how attractive this region remains as a place to live and work. Some places are interested in taking on this growth, but others don't have the capacity to do that. One of the uh, challenges that we see is that the communities that tend to have the capacity City are often very distant from job centers. And what that does is it causes immense problems with transportation capital investments um, and congestion, and it becomes very difficult for us to uh, get that GHG reduction per capita that we're looking for. So those are some of the issues that we wrestle with. But some of the big takeaways um, in, in, in terms of the plan, in, in terms of household growth, three quarters of the growth is in these priority development areas. Uh, 46% of the new household growth is located in the three big cities of San Francisco <coughs> and San Jose. Uh, we were in this forecast to experience some growth, but at a very small share uh, of the regional growth. So what we're seeing here is about 1%, or roughly 8,000 households uh, between 2010 and 2040. Comparably, Alameda County is taking on 23 times more growth than we're in. Santa Clara County is taking on 32 times more growth, uh, and San Francisco City alone is taking on 17 times more growth. From a countywide uh, basis, the growth numbers, 8,400 households, 13,000 jobs, roughly, roughly 1,300 of those households will be inside uh, PBAs. And kind of drilling down some of the local jurisdictional uh, numbers, we, we released a draft preferred scenario uh, last summer. And what I wanted to do here is just walk through some of the changes that were made between the draft and the final preferred. And these final preferred figures, uh, which is sort of the, the fourth column over, were approved in November. Between the draft and the final, we received many comments from local jurisdictions, and so we did meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with many of these uh, local planning directors and, and made some modifications to our land use assumptions. Most of the changes were not major between the draft and the final. Um, but for some jurisdictions, uh, they were fairly substantial. Um, so I'm running through some of those jurisdictional numbers right now um, in Marin. You know, again, on a countywide basis, between the draft and the final, in Marin County, the household numbers were reduced by roughly 4,300. On the jobs front, um, similarly, we, we worked through some issues. Uh, these are the uh, jurisdictional numbers uh, for uh, employment 2040. You can see the changes between the draft preferred and the final preferred, um, and also a little bit of a downtick between the draft and the final um, in terms of jobs, about 2,600, but we're, we're seeing the employment go from around 121,000 in 2010 to roughly 135,000 in 2040. As Bobby mentioned, a lot of this job growth sort of already happened between 2010 and now. We have to remember um, the economic cycles are very cyclical. Um, we're in a boom now, uh, we could also experience a downturn. I want to turn to transportation uh, real quick, which is a big part of what we do um, as well. Uh, we have significant resources to operate and improve the transportation system. Um, they are not uh, certainly infinite, but in this region, uh, that is thanks to voters that have opened up their checkbooks time and time again to improve sales tax measures in nearly every Bay Area County. The preponderance of resources that we see uh, for transportation in this region are from local sources. That's actually very uh, different relative to other places around the country, which are more reliant on federal and state sources. Not every project submitted for inclusion in this plan was able to fit within the fiscal 
constraint that we have. So over 100 billion in projects and maintenance funding um, had to be cut in order to fit the investment package in the fiscally constrained envelope. So we received roughly $428 million worth of projects and we went out and did our call. Uh, but the plan is fiscally constrained at 303. Um, <coughs> I think it's between 2010 and 2040, so that means we had to make a few uh, tough choices in terms of transportation. Just the overall breakdown of how that uh, forecasted revenue is spent. Uh, roughly 90% of the revenue um, is devoted to operating, maintaining, and modernizing the existing system that we have. Um, and uh, when we talk about modernizing the system, uh, that also can mean increasing some service levels uh, for our transit system. Uh, it can mean uh, getting our transit systems up to a state of good repair. Expanding the system is, uh, is not a big part of the plan. This is expanding uh, both fixed highway transit as well as a little bit of highway capacity, and that is 10% of the total plan. Uh, we also run through some of the discretionary revenue. This slide kind of runs through uh, how we spent the 74 billion. I've been shown I have two minutes left, so I'm going to kind of go through this just quickly. The three strategies: uh, operating and maintaining the system of 218 billion. The the lion's share of of the plan in this category is really transit operations. That is 120 billion of the 303. So it's a huge part of what we do out there. It's just operate and maintain our transit systems, the existing ones that we have. Modernizing the system, uh, about 50 billion, and then expanding the system, 31 billion. Uh, and actually, um, a great share of that 31 billion in terms of expand is from transit. We're in counting the following projects are included in the plan, and of course these are, uh, these are projects that are um, not mysterious to anyone in this room, they've been things that uh, you guys have been working on for a very long time, um, but they are included in the plan and fiscally concerned. In addition to the, the transportation investments and the land use shifts, we also do have a climate initiatives program that actually helps the Bay Area exceed its 2035 targets. So those, those are also included. Um, whether it's motivating more electric vehicles, looking at bike share infrastructure, car sharing, transportation alternatives, trip caps, uh, also a big plan, big part of the plan. I think one of the one of the big things that I want to turn to is just kind of closing with this is the affordability challenges that we still see um, with our plan. While, while we do, uh, while the plan does do better than the no project in terms of affordability. Um, we are still foreseeing housing and transportation costs, especially for low-income folks in this region, rising. Um, so while the plan does accommodate the expected region's population, one of the problems that we see is it doesn't necessarily do it affordably. And that is what's motivating work on the action plan, which is what we're going to be talking about in the next session, is that our commission has really asked us to look at what will it take to kind of bend this curve in terms of housing affordability in this region. Because obviously moving it from 54% to 67% for low-income households is not a great result. But we want to be upfront with people about those particular challenges that we're facing in the region. So based on the feedback received from my final slide, staff's going to be finalizing the draft plan and the EIR preparing for consideration for adoption this summer. So with that, I think we're going to move on to the panel discussion and I'm happy to take it to Q&A. Thank you, to Ma'am, to all our panelists. We're going to take time now for questions. We've got the next 20 minutes, and we, we're going to have questioners on both sides. Pat and Renee will hand the microphone. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and uh, Renee and I will stand next to the person. And we've separated the room. Keep the two of us. Hi, uh, Kathy Schaefer. Um, I have a question. Um, I've read the, the uh, ABAG plan, and as you mentioned, 90% uh, of the existing funding is for transportation is scheduled to go for maintenance and continuing kind of keeping our system working as it is today. So I have a question then about how that relates to supporting some of the, the growth initiatives and the PDA efforts. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, I'm a little confused as to how, if we're supporting and funding 
uh, and rightly so, maintaining our existing system, it doesn't seem like we have any money for the PDA areas. And how does that work? Well, when, when we talk about expanding the system with, with 10%, I just want to be clear on sort of what's in that category. So really what we're looking there uh, is sort of expanding fixed guideway, largely rail, heavy rail transit. So things like SMART um, would be in that category. Um, and also, uh, to the extent that we have capacity improvements on some parts of our highway system, those are also in uh, that 10%. I would say that actually um, what's most pivotal for priority development areas are probably more what's in that operate, maintain, and modernize category. Uh, so whether it's, it's trying to get our uh, streets, kind of complete streets policies, trying to get more bike and head infrastructure, trying to get more transit service when we can, trying to get a more updated fleet uh, in terms of our transit. I mean, those are the types of things, some streetscape projects, I mean, those are things in terms of PDAs that might actually reduce development costs from time to time. So I actually think that a lot of what's in that category of things that support PDAs um, are, are frankly actually in that 90% more than they are in the 10. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Um, first of all, David, um, you actually put up some stats, and uh, really my concern here is there's a false narrative and intellectual dishonesty going on with the plan. So you showed some stats showing the share of commute, and you explained the decline in car commuting as being caused by a switch to bike and transit. Uh, you seem to completely gloss over the fact that working from home was the major reason, or one of the main, most significant contributors. So I felt that was dishonest. You showed the stats and lost over that. Secondly, uh, you, you present the premise that uh, if, if we build, we will get people moving to where they, near where they work. What will happen really with buildings like Wigan, which is 10% affordable, is 90% of those units will go to high paid tech workers and city workers who will add to the traffic congestion, which is our acute issue. The remaining 10% or whatever is given to affordable, as I can show it later on, this is a question. So what's going on with the affordable parts of the units are, with HUD rulings, those cannot be allocated to local workers, that would be dishonest. So you're showing a dishonest thing that we need to build housing near jobs. And then lastly, can you answer the number one and number two projects? SMART is, according to Plan Bay Area, Appendix E, mid-century sea level rise will 50% inundate that project. So can you tell me why we're putting all our eggs into a basket for this underwater train that is supposed to solve our transportation issues? Thank you. So I think I got all that. I will try to answer each of the three parts. So first of all, I, I agree telecommuting is part of that. I, I will say of those five percentage points, and two of them are from transit. Part of it is from telecommuting. In San Francisco, the walking and biking trends have been the primary drivers. So different parts of the region had different drivers. And most of those changes in mode shift have been in the Central Bay Area. So that's what I was referring to, is that we're in County may have had changes in terms of more people parking at home. But unfortunately, other mode shares have, have changed as well. Um, to, your, uh, to your second point about jobs and housing being close, closer together, you know, I, if we can have the right match of jobs and housing in close proximity, what we see is that the VMT, the vehicle miles traveled, the people who live in those developments uh, are lower. I mean, if you look at the development patterns of the Bay Area today, housing is being produced in two distinct areas. In the places like San Francisco, close to the high wage jobs, and then in very distant suburbs. And those folks are typically driving long distances to get to work. And what we call the inner ring suburbs of the very little housing is being produced. And so this gap, and I'm referring to those interrings, I've already talked about places like uh, parts of Silicon Valley where very little housing is being produced and lots of jobs are being created. That gap has created a very difficult commuting pattern. Um, the third, uh, third part of the question oh, related to sea level rise, just quickly, look, SMART isn't the only transportation asset that is at high risk of sea level rise. As you'll see on our vital science tool, numerous freeways, including US 101 here in Marin, including US 1 on the peninsula, are at risk of sea level rise. And that's why we have resilience as one of our key areas of the action plan to protect our infrastructure. 
One of the questions that we've gotten so far is that um, they want a copy, you all want copies of the slides. The slides will be posted on the planmateareaorg and under the Marin County Workshop, um, and so you'll be able to download them on Monday. The next questioner is Susan Hirsch. Susan? Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'd like to bring up this question of your regional forecast of jobs, population, and housing, which is a part of the plan. And while you've provided some valuable information with great detail about the percentages of people moving here or there and who lives at home or how far um, miles people compute, commute, the key finding, I think, of Plan Bay Area is that by your own studies, you're predicting that this plan hollows out the middle class. And what you show in your own diagram is that from 2010 to projecting to 2040, instead of a bell-shaped curve that would show a house, a, a healthy economy and a social and educational and family and a recreational kind of lifestyle for the majority of people, what your plan shows is that that bell-shaped curve is inverted and we end up having goal posts. So there's a whole lot of very rich and wealthy people who come out of this plan and a whole lot of very poor people. So my question is, like, how is it we have so many people and so much of our money going into working on a transportation and housing plan, which by your own conclusions, diminishes and violates what is such a strong characteristic of strong American values as the middle class. Well, I think the, the first thing I would, I would say to that is that in terms of the, the crisis that's facing the middle class and, and the gap between rich and poor, um, I think the plan is uh, trying to point that out in abundant fashion. Um, I think the question is, where do we sort of ascribe the blame for that? Um, you know, this is a problem, uh, this is sort of how we think about the last presidential election in a lot of ways. Um, you know, this is things that are national uh, trends that are going on, and, and, and we're seeing that in this region as well. Um, when it comes to, you know, the plan's performance, I think it's always important to look at how the plan performs relative to no plan at all. Um, and, you know, so that's also an important uh, piece of this that we need to think about. When we look at that relative performance and we look at issues like housing and transportation costs, displacement risk, and things like that, the plan does perform better than no plan. So we are making some progress uh, in that direction. Um, as I think you know, we're, we're limited in terms of the resources that we have and we can't do everything in this plan to solve these problems, many of which um, are, I think are just problems that are happening outside of the national level in this country. And I think that's also what's motivated our commission to ask that question of what will it take if, if this plan is making H plus T affordability worse for lower income families, and if that's the trajectory that we're seeing out to 2040, you know, with or without a plan, what can we do? How can we motivate more affordability in this region? Do we need, what are the policies that we need on the local level? Uh, so those are some of the, the, the things that we're trying to figure out. But I, you know, I agree with you with, with the middle class question from an overall standpoint. Uh, can I add something to that question? Um, so I think the numbers you're referring to are at the regional level doing the forecast. So when we do the forecast, we didn't really... So it's the first step of making the plan. By doing the forecast, we were doing in terms of the historical trend and what's happening in the economy. And then we have this plan to really talk about how we address the issues we just raised. Before we take the next question, if I might, um, I think sometimes it's helpful to get up to the 35,000 foot level when we look at these problems. And if you look at the entire West Coast from San Diego to Seattle, uh, you will see that there is a similar uh, problem with the hollowing out of the middle class. The pressures on the coastal areas all up and down the west coast and the transportation challenges, they're the same up and down the west coast of the United States and elsewhere. And so 
I don't think we can say Plan B area is the cause of the hollowing out. I think we're seeing this in the western part of the U.S. just because of the way our geography and our development patterns have grown. So I just want to throw that in there. And it also says to us, let's look at other places who have these same problems and work together on solutions. So, yes, Mayor First from Court of Madeira. Hi, thank you, Diane First. Um, I have three questions. My first one is about jobs projection numbers. Um, in a recent meeting, I asked you, Matt, about housing numbers and how we can get the data that underlies that. Um, I have been very frustrated not being able to get information out of AVAG and FTC, so I'm now making my request about the jobs numbers. Would it be possible to find out at a city level how you were calculating those jobs? Because you have Corn Madera down for 700, and I don't know if half of our population is going to stay home writing screenplays or just how you're going to get to that. My second question has to do with displacement. Um, Corn Madera is right on the bay. Uh, about a quarter, uh, maybe even a little bit more than that, of our current households are in a FEMA flood zone. Our transportation infrastructure, as well as other infrastructure like sewers, uh, storm drains, are really incredibly vulnerable to sea level. Why are you loading up Port of Madeira with so many household numbers? And my third question has to do with displacement. Uh, the much maligned wind cup uh, development. Um, it, the, back, this is before my time, folks, but the, the council and um, a citizens committee decided to put a whole bunch of the housing there when they loaded up Port of Madeira with a huge quota. They made that decision because they didn't want to displace many of our middle income residents by zoning our multifamily areas of our, our community, as well as single family homes, for massive development. We would have lost so many of our friends and neighbors who are living in older, more um, affordable apartment complexes. Uh, why are you loading up a town that is built out when really one of the only options we would have is to displace our middle income and lower income folks? Thank you. In, in terms of households and jobs data, uh, we're, we're happy to sit down with, with anyone to go over the details. Um, so I think between the draft and the final uh, preferred scenario, we sat down with the Board of Madera Planning Director, and we're happy to sit down with you to go through, and I think it's better to sit down one-on-one -on -one to go through uh, all the data, to kind of work through exactly um, what you want to see. Um, you know, I, I think uh, in terms of, uh, of loading up the city with housing and jobs numbers, um, first I just want to say I acknowledge your concern about that. And so, um, you know, we want to hear that. Again, uh, but I also want to say at the same time that, um, you know, the county itself in totality uh, is taking on about 1% of the region's housing growth um, between 2010 and 2040. And that's pretty consistent with uh, the trends that we've seen uh, between 2000 and 2015. So, um, you know, perhaps we need to sharpen our pencils a bit as we get down to the local level and making sure everything you've got on the books in terms of zoning, other ordinances, to make sure that we really understand the local communities. And I think we are evolving in that way. We're doing the best we can. It, it's, it's a very big region. Sea level rise is, I think, an issue that um, is, is perplexing all of us. Um, it, is, it is coming our way. We have a PDA-focused plan, and a lot of those PDAs are located close to the bay. That is, that is true. Um, and again, these are locally nominated areas for growth, but we are seeing uh, truly that a lot of those PDAs are in areas that are at risk of sea level rise. And I think as we do our regional planning, we have to start really looking at an assessment for those PDAs, not just in terms of the market potential for them, um, but also in terms of the real threats that they face and are there strategies at the local level and, and can the agencies provide any, any technical assistance to local governments in terms of how to, to mitigate and adapt to rising tides. 
um, as we all as we all discuss. Um, of course, at the same time, as you know, that challenge um, is so difficult because of our legacy of protecting open space and natural areas. So we have a plan here that does not encroach on regional open space. Um, so you can just see from a geographic perspective when you look at this region how difficult that is for us um, when we have only so little of the geography that will take on growth. Um, but those are the same areas that are um, that we're seeing those threats to sea level rise. So it's you know I just want to acknowledge it's a huge thorny challenge. We feel it too, um, and uh, and we want to get it right. And uh, I think as we move ahead in our regional planning, um, uh, we're going to work towards those ends. Thank you very much. Excuse me, but we have several people that have been in line. I just wanted to make note that we're trying to capture your questions and comments. So. If we don't get them right, and you can see it from where you're standing, please go up and, and talk to the recorder. Bob has the next question, and we're alternating from between myself and Renee. Uh, Bob Bundy. I attended the uh, uh, TAMS uh, uh, conference on the future of transportation in Marin, which was very interesting. And if the future really is autonomous vehicles, both public and private, uh, then the recommendation that came out of that was along the lines of what you said, 90% should go to maintenance of your existing infrastructure and maybe only 10% to new projects. That uh, in the future, the existing infrastructure may handle capacity much better than it does now with autonomous vehicles. The 10%, I would think, should go to the biggest problem that I see in uh, Central Marin, which is the 101-580 problem and not having that connection there, that creates a lot of our traffic backup uh, and also it's a huge carbon footprint of all these cars idling to get to the Richmond Bridge. You know, I think in terms, I'll just say, in terms of autonomous vehicles, that's something you guys are bringing up like the two, two of the biggest authority planning issues that we're dealing with right now, sea level rise and autonomous vehicles. Um, and I think, as you said, autonomous vehicles is really um, something that we're trying to get our head around to what it means. Um, it could mean that uh, we could have vehicles uh, much closer together. It, it could mean that we solve some of the congestion problems. The big question in our mind is, are those autonomous vehicles actually going to be cleaner than the fleet that's out there today? Um, maybe, maybe not. You know, I, have some, I have a family member that's working in that field down in Silicon Valley. And he's often concerned that the types of autonomous vehicles they're designing are not necessarily clean vehicles. And I think sometimes we get caught up in that, just thinking you know, autonomous means clean. It doesn't. Um, and, and so I think that's an open question that we're, that we're trying to work on, too. A lot more working on. Okay. My name is George. I'm a resident of Marin County. Um, I'd like to ask the panel if you assume as part of your overall view of this whole situation that human beings are part of the ecology. We are part of the ecology, right? Yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, so it's pretty clear that the ideal situation is to have people living near where they work. Correct? So that the transportation system will always be overwhelmed large numbers of people who work in Marin County have to live far away in order to continue to uh, have a house, but also have a job. So it seems to me fairly obvious that we need more affordable housing closer to the work sites in the county of Marin. It also seems to me that if there is going to be sea level rise, we'll need a lot of workers to build whatever structures we need to protect transportation lines, and those people will presumably need to live near where they work in the Marin County as well. So what I'm wondering is, doesn't the panel agree that the mindset related to affordable housing, where people live, etc., that mindset needs to change. The fact that there's a huge amount of open space in Marin County is taken as something that must last forever. That doesn't make any sense. We're destroying our environment to save our environment? Comments, please. A couple comments. First, um, the first thing that I want to say first and foremost, of 
for us. So we've got the local elected officials here. Is the local land use um, is local. Uh, it's not regional. Um, we don't create land use policies or prescribe them in this plan. So that's the first thing. It's important to say that those decisions are made at the local level. When we do analysis on the region in terms of jobs and housing, uh, we often know that we've got a scenario, an alternative that kind of looks at this in one way, which is kind of this big cities alternative, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and and one, of the, uh, one of the things that we try to do there is we try to motivate a lot more housing growth down in Silicon Valley. So how about that? You know, a lot of jobs, not much housing. So big cities um, uh, really ramps up housing in places like Mountain View, Palo Alto, uh, and what we see uh, is that uh, there are improvements in terms of uh, some measures, VMT and GHG on a regional level. But again, this all comes back to, uh, I think, local willingness. And there's no one size fits all. And things that might work down in Silicon Valley, well, Silicon Valley is not too fond of that scenario. <laughs> um, but it's out there. And I think it's important to, to, you know, to kind of look at that as a potential future. So we have um, five more minutes of questions. So um, if you can uh, make your question really short, that'd be great. The next questioner is Janet. Thank you. Um, I know you've mentioned that uh, your general planning uh, for ABAG and MTC is responsive to the um, regional transportation plan. It's responsive to the regional housing needs allocation. And now it's responsive to the sustainable communities mandates. What would it take to embark on a planning effort that encompasses a vision that would solve the problem that we have from a transition from a bell curve community to a valley curve community um, on a scale with what the Bay Area Air Quality Management District recently did when it pivoted from simply doing a clean air plan to doing a regional climate protection strategy with a really bold vision, not necessarily filling in all the dots, but putting the marker out there. And what I see missing in this plan is that marker. So what would it take for this community to have our agencies produce such a vision and a strategic plan? You're, you're talking primarily about GHG air quality? All of it. All of it. All of it. Um, well, I, I, think, I think we are working as two agencies, and, and we may emerge soon, toward planning on the regional level that is more comprehensive. Um, I would say that is something that at the staff level we feel like we're moving toward. I think that our regional plans to date are focused primarily on housing and transportation. That's a big part um, you know, of our ecosystem and, and of the thing that makes our region tick, but it's not all of it. Um, I think one of the issues, and, and this was brought up earlier when we started talking about the middle class, you know, I think one of those issues that we need to really start dealing with is, is economic development and middle wage jobs in a real way. It, it's difficult for our plan, uh, you know, our, our plan is not a vehicle to attract and retain business. We don't have any power to do that in the plan. We can just set a framework for infrastructure and housing and jobs. But you know, the ABAC folks are, uh, have been working a lot on this economic development piece as well, whether it's creating an economic development district uh, for the region, uh, which potentially could poise us for some federal money um, to work towards attracting and retaining business. Economic development, though, for, on a regional level is difficult. Um, but I think that it needs to be more central in our regional plan. Pat, will there be another opportunity for question and answer? We have a, a plethora of people. Yeah, just let's keep going. Um, we have a few more minutes, about four more minutes. I have some money. Um, there's been a number of studies on the autonomous future and the shared air flow future. And the latest one is totally disruptive. And that is prediction that by 2030, 90% of the vehicles in the world will be electric and autonomous. Now, to try to plan for a 2040 year time frame, when this kind of disruption is seems kind of you know, difficult to plan. And I hear you talking about greenhouse gas emissions all the time, and it's just something you just don't drop. It's not an issue anymore. You know? 
it's not an issue of property. It, you, in five years' time, it would be a zero issue. It's close to that. Okay. So the, the future of autonomous vehicles in this study predicts so many people will be sharing cars in an environment where the, the online system facilitates that. One of the predictions out of that is a 50% increase in vehicle miles traveled as a result of that. Let me repeat that. 50% increase in vehicle miles traveled. So the, the, the whole concept of trying to plan for the year 2040, when I don't hear you talking other than greenhouse gas as, as one of the goals here, uh, it, it devalues your, what you're saying when you speak. Well, now, and when you talk about the Spurs played recently about the, the huge campuses being built nowhere near transit in the peninsula, and of course, there's it, nowhere near transit, and the transit's off rail. So, if I might, so, is your question how does this plan address autonomous vehicles? And the, and the real future is probably going to happen. It's probably going to happen. Thank you. So if I may, I just want to provide a quick response. You know, greenhouse gas emissions is a, a goal of this plan both before and after the state added it as a mandate. There's another reason why we want to focus growth and encourage use of transit and all these other things. Look, if people are living in more walkable communities, they're healthier, they're able to walk and bike more, and regardless of whether the vehicle is something you drive or it's autonomous, we want to create livable, walkable places where people can walk to the coffee shop and pick up their kids from school and not have to be out there on the freeways in traffic. I think um, although technologies have the opportunity to do so much for our region, I just want to emphasize that even if all our vehicles were electric today, there are a lot of good reasons for investing in our downtowns and really making our, our region healthier and more walkable. Okay, that's the next question. I just want to let you know that we're going to keep going with the questions and we're going to narrow the breakdown and hopefully you don't um, yell at us too much about that. I did want to make um, a point. There's a comment form. I encourage you to put your comments down on that for Plan Bay Area. There's also a meeting evaluation form. We really need you to fill it out so we can keep improving on these workshops. The next um, questioner is David. Thanks, David Pilpel. I'm up here from uh, San Francisco. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you for this format. Uh, this is much better and different than the open houses in the other counties, and I think. Um, all of the nine counties should have this open, uh, this presentation format. Um, I commented to Ken, the planning director, the other night about local land use plans, area plans, um, general plans, planning code amendments. Um, I think that ABAG and MTC should provide comments to local jurisdictions on whether those plans support the regional goals here or don't. And right now, ABAG and MTC don't generally provide uh, comments on um, verbiage like that. Um, I also, and I appreciate a lot of the, the questions and, and comments that have um, come before me. I think whether you address it uh, now or in the plan, the impact of uh, SB1 and Regional Measure 3 uh, should be talked about, and, and I thought this would be uh, an opportunity to do that. Um, and I'll leave it at that because we're running short on time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Renee? Did you want to say anything in response? Okay. Yeah. Is it working? Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Wendy Callens, um, numerous organizations. Uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this plan, and, and I want to thank you for your efforts. Um, I think that uh, you're handicapped by having to work with the tools that are available to you in today's world. And I think a lot of what people are asking about is how do we prepare for the tools that are coming just around the corner. And I think when, when it comes to um, electric and, and um, autonomous vehicles, there's two scenarios. Uh, one is the nightmare scenario where everybody's got their own autonomous vehicle and, and it's not electric because um, it they don't have to be. And the other scenario is the one where people more and more use shared vehicles, and this is where I think uh, the this is an opportunity missed. 
um, maybe there's still time to really incorporate what can we do to start incorporating more of the shared use technology. And I'm not just talking about carpooling. I'm talking about autonomous jitneys, the first and last mile of the fixed rail. What do we do to make transit work? Because right now, no matter how much money we're investing in our operations, it still really doesn't work well. Uh, we've got a group of kids in Kentfield wanting to take the bus to school that is continually 20 minutes late. And this is what we put up with in Marin County is it's not efficient, it's not reliable, and um, it's not frequent enough. And in most of the outlying areas that we don't have effective transportation. So we actually do need more funding. And that comes to the second piece, which is um, a number of us went to the state with this new transportation bill and we lobbied for more transit funding. And we were able to get a bit more transit funding, but the questions we get asked by our legislatures is your regional transportation agency asking for this? We need you to be with us when we're asking for more money. We need you to be asking the state for more money for transit operations. Thank you. I'll just give a quick response to the first half of your, of your question. The second half, you know, we, we were very active lobbying for SB1, so I, I guess I, I would say you know, a lot of our staff were deeply involved in that. But for I, I mean, I believe we were, you know, strongly supportive of making sure transit had a key role in that bill. Um, I, I guess to get to your first question about the mobility, look, planners across America are looking at this autonomous question right now. We are, we have started a project on the future of mobility with the other California metropolitan planning organizations to look at this very issue. We don't have all the answers yet, but, when, but that work will conclude in the next year or so, and we fully intend to incorporate that in our next long range plan. Okay, I'm sorry, but um, we're going to do two more questions, and I'm sorry I was taking it out of order. This gentleman had his hand up first. Thanks very much. Dave Corey. I want to go back to what Susan Kirsch was talking about, which is equity. And I think one of the issues that we have here in Marin is we've been so effective at controlling growth that basically we're squeezing out our workers. The fastest growing segment is the so personal service workers that tend to be at the lower incomes uh, end of the uh, workplace. So we're in fact putting a higher burden on the region to house our workers. We're becoming a plantation economy. And I would like to know what... Oh, no one can see me. <laughs> this, this is really the first. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take this in. Okay, so I, I'm hoping that it's not just jobs and housing, but who lives there? I think that's the key towards advancing equity and preserving what remnants of the middle class we have. But I'm much more interested in promoting the rights and the voice of the underserved people, and the people who are being most displaced, particularly in Marin, but also in San Francisco and other places. And yes, it's a regional problem but it's especially exacerbated by the situations in Marin where growth is so controlled on single-family homes and improvements and that the examples of multi-family housing are the gargantuan, disgusting examples of Wincott and not the happy circumstances just across the freeway as a result of a suit against Corte Madera of San Clemente Place. Thank you. So with regards to affordable housing, you know, Matt in his presentation did show that we have identified some example policies that we think could help move the region in the right direction. And in fact, those policies lead us to make progress on affordable housing. We're actually going in the right direction on that performance target, thanks to a lot of those policies. Uh, one of those example policies is the, an inclusionary requirement for cities across the region that have priority development areas. That might be, a, might be one way to move in, in the right direction. Another thing that I, I would bring up is that there is definitely this, this issue of a lack of fit between the jobs and the housing here in Marin. Um, but in the future, we expect a lot of the job growth to be continually concentrated in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. It's, as much as we may want to 
provide more opportunities in the rest of the region. We don't have a lot of policies to move those jobs around. And so the reason why the plan puts so little growth in Marin compared to the rest of the region is because we want to make sure that where that job growth is happening is also where the housing is happening. And the plan really doesn't, you know, I think a, a stronger job than perhaps in decades past in making sure those are closely aligned. Okay, one name. My name's Chris Tiburon. Following up on Callan's comment, you seem quite concerned about poor people in Marin and uh, their lower cost ridership, for example, and higher costs. What does your plan do to subsidize bus fares which are going up? Gas taxes are going up, auto registration is going up, bridge tolls are going up. That obviously affects the poor, probably more than like transit. Also, what about changing zoning laws so that people can more easily work from home, or even establish, for example, a small business at home, but these onerous rules about you have to be in a commercial zone, things of that nature. I haven't had a chance to read the entire plan. Maybe I'm going to please address that. Thank you. So with regards to transportation costs, the plan does include an equ equity roadmap, which includes a proposal to do a means-based fare, really look at the incomes of folks and align with transit fares more directly with them. Um, but what I will say is, you saw the slide Matt, Matt showed about the rising unaffordability of the region. We expect, you know, a 13 percentage point rise in the share of income spent on housing and transportation. One of those 13 percentage points is transportation, 12 of them are housing. So although we are very concerned about the cost of transportation, if we don't get this housing cost issue in line, it will overwhelm any savings we're able to achieve on the transportation front. Okay, I want to thank our panelists for their presentations. Thank you very much.